Hi there, my name is James Scott and welcome to Valley to Vietnam, a joint effort between the Sacramento Public Library and the Vietnam Vets of America, Chapter 500. It's our intent to trace the arc of experience of our vets as they went from Sacramento to Vietnam and then back again. Today, a little bit different. Uh, we have yet another alumnus of the New York uh, element of Valley to Vietnam. I'm very happy to welcome William Hughes. Thanks, Thanks very much Thank for you. being on, 1st Battalion, 26 Marines, um, and a U.S. Marine, Semper Fi, Mac. Semper Fi. Tell us a bit about growing up on Long Island um, during the 50s and 60s. What kind of place was it? And uh, tell us what you can about it. Growing up on Long Island in those days, um, it was, as I've said, it was Huckleberry Finn. It was Tom Sawyer, but it was also Holden Coalfield. Okay. Um, it was a very free, beautiful, bucolic life in a way. There was water everywhere. There were woods to play in right down the street from where we lived. So it was a, a privileged life in a way. Um, as I say, our family wasn't wealthy, or, but we also weren't poor. Um, it, was, it was delightful. Um, everybody knew everybody. Um, as a child especially, the beaches were close at hand at all times and the city was a great adventure. It was free, okay. it was free. There weren't, I, I don't remember our parents worrying about much when we left the house for the day and winters, winters were a great adventure, a, <laughs> a great privilege um, to play in the winter. So it was, uh, like I said, it's Huckleberry. It was Hannibal for all, for all of us. Your brother goes away, joins the Marines, Things are becoming uh, a bit heated in Southeast Asia, um, and in time, you graduate high school and you have to make a decision mm. uh, about what comes next. Tell us a bit about that and the road that took well, you to Well, yeah, the decision was almost not my own. I didn't have a decision to make, and uh, my brother had been in college, I think, for two years and left to, to join the Marine Corps. I went down to Paris Island to see him graduate with my parents, and I guess I was a junior in high school then, okay. I think, or maybe a senior. And I saw all the things that my older brother was always a big influence on me was, was doing. So um, I, I joined the Marine Corps, um, almost as a reflex action. But because my brother was in the Marine Corps, then I, uh, and he told me, you know, it's your decision. He didn't right. influence me one way or the other. Okay. So I joined the Marine Corps for four years. Almost as soon as I graduated, um, I was off to Paris Island. Okay, and that's, that's down in South Carolina. Yeah. So you, you go through boot camp, and, you're, and you graduate, and your first assignment um, is not Vietnam. It's kind of a... Um, Harkening back to the, the original purpose of the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. you're actually shipboard. Um, tell us a bit about that. I was stationed in D.C. initially, and that was for uh, for guard duty mostly, uh, high end or kind of middle ground guard duty. See, I wanted to go to Europe. I wanted to go to sea. I knew I was given up rather a casual detail to go to the infantry, but I wanted to go. I wanted to be in the Marine Corps, I think, uh, but I wanted to go overseas. So I went to Camp Lejeune to a battalion that was preparing to go uh, on board ship, the Marine contingent that's always on board ship in the uh, battalion of Marines in the uh, Mediterranean. And uh, away we went uh, from Moorhead City, North Carolina. I can remember the first night out, a big storm. Oh, man. <laughs> it was a Bosch painting. <laughs> Everybody was seasick. Oh, it was horrible. And of course, to sail across the ocean was, it was unbelievable. We stopped in Spain, um, and then we proceeded to go to Italy and Turkey and Malta. It was it was remarkable. It was a lot of work because we were in the infantry and we would land and you know go through these exercises, okay. uh, live fire exercises sometimes. But again, it was all seemed just like exercises. But I got to see Europe. Two weeks at sea without seeing the earth, and then seeing a port <sighs> is just um, you're attached to the past big time. Right. You uh, serve out your time uh, in Europe, and of course you're eventually going to go in country. Tell us about that process and eventually ending up on Hill 55 yeah. in I Corps. Well, I had been in the service, I'd been in the Corps for about two years, and you kind of knew, because um, things were picking up in Vietnam, but again, it was still a long ways away from any reality. But you knew after a certain time you were going. 
Okay. You were going. Not that I wanted to, but then uh, <clears throat> my orders came in and I went to Camp Pendleton out here in California. I was from Camp Lejeune, and I remember coming out all by myself and uh, showing up with my sea bag out of Camp Pendleton, vast, dark, and empty. I remember the night I reported. It seemed like I was the only one on the planet. And they had just reopened Las Pulgas, which was a base I don't think that had been used since the Second World War because Vietnam was starting to, to build up. And our training began there for Vietnam, or our physical training began. There was no jungle or anything. It was just high desert agony. Um, they ground us down. It was, it was tough business. And we were cut off. You know, we couldn't drink because uh, we were drinking at 20. We were a long way from home, you know. Yeah. It was tough because we knew we weren't going back. We were going the other way. So they, boy, they worked us over. But I was promoted to corporal. I started to take on a little responsibility, but I had been promoted to corporal, um, kind of in charge of a couple of guys. We got on board ship in San Diego, and then we head, headed out. So as I told, you know, as we talked about, we, <laughs> we stopped at Iwo Jima on the way over. It's pretty amazing. Even, even then, I look back on it now almost in jest in a way. But it was, and they played John Wayne's movie on board. We were on kind of a helicopter ship, so there was that's a. That's right, and it was outside, right? It was outside. It was on a and landing. With the, thing. the backdrop of the backdrop Mount Suribachi. was Iwo Jima. Yeah. It was Mount Suribachi, and then we stopped in the Philippines in Subic Bay, in the great giant base there, you know, full of the Seventh Fleet aircraft carriers, and it was very impressive. Um, and then we trained in the jungle there. We went out and they. They really broke our backs. Boy, they really worked us real hard. As our gunnery sergeant said, you, you're going to war. But I remember one 25-mile force march in the rain, um, getting us ready, yeah. getting us ready. Right. Sleeping on the beach, pouring rain on the beach, then getting us ready. And then, and then we headed to Vietnam, and our first duty, our battalion, was on board ship. We were on the Vancouver, if I'm not mistaken, right. a helicopter landing craft ship ship and our responsibility was if a unit was being getting it bad um, ashore we would go ashore as support or sometimes we would just go ashore on these battalion search and destroy missions the mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. standard procedure and the first couple of times out no problem I think it was once or twice we went ashore like we'd always done them you know marched around packs except we were carrying live ammunition not that I hadn't fired live ammunition before but and it all seemed the same as back in training. And then I think it was it was up north around Contien. Um, we went in. I, I forget. Maybe it was one of the Operation Hickories. I can't remember the name of them. There were. There's an interesting thing about Vietnam. There's no Dien Bien Phu. There's no. There's Quezon and bits and yeah, pieces. But right. these battalion things you went on these names. They just vanished into history. And this time we went up and we. Had just patrolling around, walking along. I had done some scout duty, which was kind of scary, running the telephone wire from one of our positions back to the beach, but still no contact. I remember we had a swim. Uh, it was very strange business. Um, and then one night we got hit, um, probably by, as I said, by the North Vietnamese Army. I think it might have been units of, of, of Viet Cong. We weren't sure. And uh, they came uh, up to our perimeter and let us have it. Hand grenades, automatic weapon, lots of death. Uh, and that, that night, you know, as I say, the doors of hell swung open for all of us. For me, especially, well, not especially, but that night we were in combat. Right. From then on. Okay. Um, not, you know, it came and went, but from that night on, uh, a couple of guys I knew were killed. I didn't know them very well. Um, but I think like all of us there, the next day we said, uh, yeah, I gotta, I'm responsible for myself too, right. uh, for the unit of course. But okay. and from then on, it was back to the ship and then into Da Nang, the harbor at Da Nang, and then out by trucks to Hill 55 where we were gonna be stationed. And Hill 55 was in the vast rice paddy ocean okay. outside of Da Nang to protect the air base at okay. Da Nang to, I don't know, Hassle of EC, and you know, and from there, every day was the same. There were three patrol. We went out on patrol, usually uh, platoon, uh, squad size patrols, twelve to fourteen guys. And by that time, I was a sergeant. 
because by attrition mostly guys in my squad and my platoon and my company had been killed in other action. So I was a sergeant by then, so I was a squad leader, one of the squad leaders. And I would lead the squads out during the day, the long patrol, and then, uh, then there was a shorter patrol and there was a night ambush patrol. And that went on for months, right? months okay. and months. And every day we would go out, somebody would either be wounded or, or die, every day. Uh, booby traps and snipers. We very, very rarely saw anybody. Called in a lot of airstrikes on people, and it was, uh, it was tough every day. This was every day. One of the things uh, we talked about in pre-production uh, was how popular um, history, um, popular media, have have taken sort of the Vietnam scenario, the platoon, with the platoon's lieutenant or LT being the figure, um, but that wasn't necessarily the case. No. Talk about mm -hmm. the importance of a good squad leader um, in getting, getting everybody through. Yeah, especially off Hill 55, um, because you occasionally you would go out like in a company, but that was, um, it was almost too unmanageable in the rice paddies. So these, these were squads every day, and the squad leader was, was the cement, right. made the thing happen each day. And uh, two good guys, good machine gunner and his ammo carrier were outside of your own squad, but they were initial to the squad. They were the guys who were gonna make stuff happen. Right. And learning how to call in airstrikes and learning how to read a map. I mean, uh, we had talked about it, it was almost like osmosis. Right. I didn't even right. learn it. The day after we <sighs> were first hit, I knew how to do all this stuff. Yeah. I could talk to pilots in their jets Right, and right, have them right. drop stuff on. Yeah. Without a map and a compass, you couldn't call in artillery or mortar fire. Right. In fact, when I left, you know, you couldn't, weren't supposed to bring anything out. I wanted to bring my maps home with me. Right. But I could, I, I couldn't, I don't think I could do it now. But I could, do, and I would instruct other guys in the squad as we went around. Yeah. Um, and just in case something happened, how, you know, how to call in artillery. Because that became, that was the most important thing you could do in Vietnam, because that's what the war was for us. If they fired on us, get as much artillery down on them as possible and get the hell. And get um, back. You know, get back. All right. Another thing is that y you really know the landscape of the literary world and then also the motion picture world and the arts world. Um, curious, the best book you've ever read yeah. on the Vietnam War? It's Dispatches, and there's no discussion. There's no, there's no up or down. It's Dispatches right. by Michael Hare. Um, I've tried other things, but they just, don't, I don't know. My brother and I agree. My brother okay. is a Vietnam vet also. We agree. Um, if, I don't know if I've met a lot of the, I, I met a lot of other people in the literary business who mm -hmm. agree. Uh, so maybe that's its great accomplishment. It's a great book, but it's also a great book. Yeah. Written in the language of Esquire from that time period, because I didn't know this until later on in life, as I started to read and just doing my own work about it. But I, I have found I didn't need to read anything else uh, about it. And as far as movies go, there's one we talked about. I can't remember the name of it. It's got a, it's it's its patrol, long distance patrol name. It was filmed in the bushes outside of L.A. Okay. Um, it's just a great film about. Everything else is a bit um, a bit much. Right. You know, we had talked about apocalypse. Um, that I've come to appreciate <laughs> more and more yeah. over the years. Right. It's right. absolute madness. People ask me what I remember about Vietnam itself. I said, I don't remember anything. I never thought of it in any kind of aesthetic sense. I remember looking out across the right at these mountains, but it never, I never said, boy, isn't that pretty. Right, right. And of course, you get the, then you get the 50 yard stare the whole time you're there. You're just looking at 50 yards in front of you. So I really have no um, relationship to it physically at all, except yeah. what was in front of me uh, on my feet. Right. Um, and then up north, and so yeah, the squad um, at, at night we'd go out in squad size and a radio because the radio operator was, you know, was wasn't Sancho Pancha, he was Cervantes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, he was there with me. It was always somebody that I could depend on. Um, and of course, the medic would right. go with us on patrol too. And they were you know, they were an unusual breed in a way. We always wondered what the hell they were doing with us. Right. If, if, but they were, you know, they weren't Marines. That was what was interesting to us. They were in the Navy. Right. But God bless them. Helicopter pilots and uh, medics, that's why I'm sitting here. Right. 
and right, uh, of right. course jet pilots, but that's a whole other ball game. But helicopter pilots, you know, they would come to our rescue whenever and wherever we needed them. Right. Yeah. right. You finish. You come back. Um, and well, I'd, I'd like to. Oh, go right. No, no. Um, then we went up north. Okay. And that's uh, you know just that's a whole other <laughs> ball game. That's where the North Vietnamese Army is. And okay. That's a whole other ball game. But we still worked in s small units, you know, but bigger units sometimes. And that's when we had some stuff going on, some more serious stuff, war in right. the almost conventional sense. But again, you know, artillery, we could we could out muscle them. So, and w you know, I remember sitting along the DMZ, watching uh, jets come across the bomb North Vietnam, North Vietnam. Right. Uh, I'm watching right. Sam missiles uh, go up in the air. So again, just to mention it in comparison to the Rice Paddy War, and the uh, Quezon, the hills right. in uh, North Viet in South Vietnam along the along the border. Right. One day, I'm yeah, I'm just sitting in my foxhole up north. I forget who I'm in it with somebody else, um, and I, it's August 9th, and I know that's my rotation date. I've been counting since I, you know, well, was born. Right. And I hear the names. I know who else is supposed to be leaving that day, and I hear the names being passed on the line. And then, you know, you, I'm sitting there saying, you know, they're not. They're going to forget me. <laughs> they're going to forget me. Um, because I, as I said, I've been a short timer for a long time. Right. And uh, lo and behold, they tell me, get my gear on, and you're going home. So I was very fortunate. I, I'd been wounded um, in a firefight up around the DMZ, up on Mudder's Ridge, <clears throat> which looked like uh, Verdun during the First World War. You know, so much artillery had been poured into it. It was, uh, it was pretty impressive in a strange way. Even I, even I remember that um, as young as I was. But I wasn't young, you know. I was... 1920. I was 20. So yeah, then uh, I get uh, I get the top. I remember climbing into a, a dump truck, like a um, yeah, like a construction dump truck. Four right. or five of us going back to the big base at Contien, where it had my rabies shots. Uh, bitten by a rat one night in an old French fort, and well, like I said to you, where the Air Force had <laughs> nightclubs and stuff. Okay, okay. It's madness. <laughs> Uh, and then I went to Okinawa. Yeah, I went to Okinawa, where I had spent uh, maybe about a month prior to that. Uh, in a, our unit was taken to Okinawa to be refitted. And uh, I told you we they had Anthony Newley performing. I forget the name of the. Um, help me get off the world or something. You're right. You know, stop the world. I want to get off. Okay. And we're right, sitting right. in the audience. You know, we're all combat veterans and. Well, again, that's apocalypse. You know, that stuff did happen. Right, right, right. So then um, I'm in Okinawa, and then uh, I'm kind of just drifting on a cloud in Okinawa. I don't even know I'm in Okinawa. I'm going home. I'm going home. And, uh, you know, this idea that I, you know, parades, I, you know, I still don't give to, you know, I don't want any parade. <laughs> I'm back. Right. I'm back. And then I, I remember going to Travis, getting a shave, uh, and then going to San Francisco Airport. And flying to New York, and I, <coughs> I tell you, it was kind of typical in Nam in a way. I called up some buddies from high school; they were busy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I just survived being killed, but they were, which was understandable. I, you know, I was. Uh, so then I, I just took a cab home from Kennedy Airport. Uh, surprised my parents; they were sitting in the backyard. They knew yeah, I was in right. back home, but uh, so. And then from there, um, I still had a year to go um, in the Corps. <laughs> they weren't going to let me out. <laughs> you know, I said, come on. You know, I've done my... But uh, it turned out okay. Like I said, the, there was another cruise um, to the Caribbean this time. And most of the guys in the units, I had been busted from sergeant down to corporal. I, I had spent a little extra time in New York. But it didn't matter then, you know. That was happening a lot to guys I knew. And okay. nobody cared about, you know, you were back. But then once we got into the Caribbean on board ship, it was really kind of pleasant. All the guys, most of the guys were were combat veterans and the officers, which are fresh out of officer's school. So we kind of had the run of the ship, as they Got would it. say. Okay. And uh, it was beautiful. It yeah. was really beautiful. Again, the Marines were there to, you know, land in the Dominica or somewhere. And we went to Cuba, Trinidad. It was right. it was beautiful because the my time was coming to an end. And then for about, 
Oh, three months, the last three or four months, I was a combat instructor at the uh, infantry training school where you go okay. after Paris Island in North Carolina, in Camp Lejeune also. Okay. okay. And then my rotation day was coming up. They said, you have to get a, another haircut. <laughs> they weren't going to let me out. But, so I got another haircut, and then I was done with the Marine Corps. So I, I, I really don't have much attachment to the Marine Corps anymore. I went up to West Virginia recently to visit a grave of a very close friend of mine who died uh, right in front of me uh, on a patrol, this fellow Joe Craft from Beach Bottom, West Virginia. But so other than that, once I left the Corps, I, I left the Corps. Um, I meet people. I discuss it with my brother. Um, we are both still attached to certain things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But once I was done, um, I was done. And you know, to, to have made it back from Vietnam, back to East Rockaway, uh, still seems um, another wor another person, right? Another another life. I've been to the Vietnam Memorial once or twice. Um, it's very touching. Um, mm -hmm. More so, what they were able to accomplish aesthetically. Uh, but to see all the names, yeah, I'm going to Ground Zero in New York in July. But uh, right. again, that is comes from the Vietnam Memorial. Right. So that's one of the things I'm really proud about the Vietnam Memorial. Um, these Maya, Maya Lin, and the people that got it made got what what it should be. Right. You you, okay. you decide. I remember a friend wrote to me before I had seen it. Said, you know, Bill, you can see yourself in it. So that really touched me. Uh, you can see, you know, the names are on you and vice versa. So I'm very, I'm very privileged. I'm very lucky with all the, you know, darkness about the uh, VA now. Mm -hmm. The VA at Mather has done, done well by me. One thing I really want to cover, um, because I think it's, it's hugely important, is who you are now, what you stand for now, um, and in particular, your artistic outlets. Um, as a writer, as a poet, um, and your interest in, of course, Hemingway. Mm -hmm. um, you're a huge uh, supporter, uh, and you have a great interest in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. You know, we talked about mm -hmm. from the Bell Tolls, things like that. Um, and then, of course, you're also attached to the art community in Sacramento mm -hmm. with Second Saturday mm -hmm. and whatnot. Can you talk about those things? Uh, when I got out of the service, I. I was just kind of blank. Um, you know, I was always interested in the arts and acting and music, but I never, I don't know, I never pursued any of it, professionally speaking. Um, and I was always interested in writing. And then slowly but surely, I had a, several jobs when I got out. I worked on Wall Street for a little while as a stockbroker. <laughs> My mother uh, told me I should take the police exam for Nassau County Police Department, which were hiring a lot then. And I took the exam, and um, I became a cop for two only for two years um, in the fourth precinct where I was from. But while I was on the police department, which is almost like the normal transition from the service, and where I'm from is cops and firemen and stockbrokers. Yeah. Uh, and then I just started to head west. Um, Berkeley was calling to me to a couple of my other friends. We were working as lifeguards, and Berkeley was calling to us. So we headed west um, to go to Berkeley to visit some friends in Berkeley. And I had let my hair grow. I had become part of the scene, more so the rock and roll scene than politics or anything attached to that in the 60s. This was about 1972 now. Okay. So we head to Berkeley, and we stop in Yellowstone on the way out, and I just fall in love with Yellowstone. Came home, had sent a, a job application to Yellowstone. And they hired me as a tour bus driver, kind of a bus dispatcher. Okay. And life in Yellowstone began. And I was hired as a ranger. Oh, lickety split, really. I had all the background, you know, the police background and my service benefits and so And I'd worked in the park. So I spent three seasons in Yellowstone. I had the great privilege of being a park ranger. But kind of typically me, I just it became a job. Okay. And there was something... Something was waiting for me that, uh, unbeknownst to me, I was working one winter as a park ranger in the Everglades, and Bob Wilson, a Democrat from San Diego, who I knew from the park, and he called me up one night. I'd sent him a book about fly fishing called My Moby Dick. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was a great <laughs> book about a guy trying to catch this rainbow, I think. Right. And he called me up one night and in the clay and said, you want to come work for me in California? 
I did, and I came to California and worked uh, at the Capitol for about three years uh, as a consultant to Bob's committee. He had the uh, Elections and Reapportion Committee. This is years ago. This is like 1881. Mm -hmm. But he also had a like a wildlife committee, I think, that he wanted me to work with. He, yeah, he wanted me to be part of his life, the Yellowstone life and so on. Okay. But it just, but it worked out. I became, because of my parks background, I became the supervisor of the tours in the restored building. And a great thing that happened to me, I gave tours of the building while it was under construction. Okay. That was for about right. six months. And that was right up my alley. I was in charge of everything. And I had begun to write. I had finally decided that I wanted to write. I'd taken a few classes while I was in the um, park service in Florida. And then I had written some of the Vietnam stuff while I was in Yellowstone one winter. And then I just found it, so this is the time to start writing. So I took a creative writing course at Sac State to get going. A friend of mine gave me Martin Eden to read, and that was it. That was the final piece. And I spent about a year, the last year of my time, with the tour program getting ready. I saved all the money I could for a year, stripped away everything, and got ready, almost in the romantic sense of it. But of course, of Hemingway's influence, a writer writes, and you know, you hope for the best. I'm not going to be a teacher. Right. I'm going to be uh, a writer. Um, and I just started, and it's been... Uh, close to 30 years now of yeah. work. Um, I've written seven novels that I became very attached to Hemingway um, through his style first and foremost, but then through his life in Spain and top of the world, moved into town. And I've always been attached to uh, Spain, but he sealed the deal. With and I've been published, you know, I'm a certified published uh, novelist. That basically does it for uh, our, our episode of Valid of Vietnam. We're coming up to the end of things. I want to say thank you well, very thanks, much, thanks Bill, for, for being on. Thanks very much. It's nice to tell the story. And yeah. it's nice to talk about Long Island. Thanks a million. I really appreciate it. You bet. Thank you yeah. um, so much. And what a journey, Odysseus, all the way right. back home. So that is going to conclude our time on Valid of Vietnam. I want to thank, of course, Bill. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Gerald Ward and India Curry, also Bob Tribe and Christy Dentry. Uh, that's basically going to do it. So farewell. We'll see you next time uh, with our next episode of Valid of Vietnam.